Hello and welcome to the Gary DeMar Show. Once again, I'm your host, Joel McDermott. And for the next three uh, segments of the Gary DeMar Show, we have a very special guest with us, Professor Scott Oliphant, who is a professor of apologetics and systematic theology at the historic Westminster Seminary just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, hello and welcome to the show, Professor. Hi, Joel. Thank you. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show and talk about some of the work you've done very recently is, is uh, because I see you as kind of one of the last of the pure Vantillians in the seminary circuit. Uh, is that an accurate assessment? Well, gosh, I'm not sure I'm competent to make that judgment. I think it's uh, certainly an accurate assessment in terms of what I want to do. Um, what, what I'm trying to do is make Van Til more widely known and, and more understandable, and I think that's, uh, that's a, a lifetime goal. So I've, I've tried to do that in, in most of what I've written and, and uh, all of what I teach. Right, and, and that, that's kind of our goal here at American Vision, too. Of course, we have the work of Greg Bonson, who spent his life expounding uh, right. Cornelius Van Til, and uh, I've recently just began reading a lot of your stuff, and I was just as impressed uh, with the, the clarity of it. Um, uh, just to give our listeners an idea, who, who exactly was Van Til, and uh, in your view, what did he accomplish as, as an apologist? Well, he was a, uh, a Dutch uh, theologian. He was born in Holland. His family moved over here when he was 10 years old. And uh, Van Til was uh, thought for most of his life that he'd either be a farmer and then later thought he'd be a pastor preacher for all of his life. And he went to Calvin College, and, and uh, as, he, as he says in different places, he, he read Bob Inc. and, and uh, Kuyper thoroughly and more than once. Um, both of those men were not translated into English, so it wasn't something that um, a lot of Americans were doing at that point. And Van Til then went to uh, Princeton and uh, earned a THM there, and then also did a Ph.D. at Princeton University. And um, after that time, he uh, taught for one year at uh, Princeton Seminary in uh, the late 20s, just during the time when uh, Dr. Machen was having trouble with the seminary and with his denomination. Right. And a year, a year later, Machen left, and uh, Van Til went out to be uh, a pastor, and um, Machen, after three invitations, uh, coerced him to come and join the newly found uh, Westminster Theological Seminary in 1929. And so Van Til came uh, to this part of the country in 29 and uh, taught here until his retirement in uh, 72, and then he died in, uh, in 87. Yeah, so he was part of the founding faculty at the historic Westminster Seminary. He was, yeah, and he, he uh, see, Machen taught a, a course in apologetics at Princeton Seminary, but um, when he brought Van Til in and heard him teach for a year, he was uh, so impressed with what Van Til was able to do that he, Machen knew that he wanted him here at Westminster. It was uh, a strategic move on Machen's part. Um, he knew that Van Til had the mind and the ability to develop a reformed apologetic in the way that it hadn't been done historically, and so uh, I, I think I'm confident that's why Machen wouldn't take no for an answer and had to ask Van Til three times to come teach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here's this farm boy, and he gets gets uh, he has a gift for academia and has a great mind. He yeah. comes to the seminary, he begins to teach, and I suppose he's already beginning to publish a lot of things. Uh, and he's he seems to me he has one goal, and that is to teach apologetics based on Scripture and within the Reformed tradition. And that, for some reason, creates a firestorm of controversy. Yeah. Uh, can, can, can you shed some light on that? I've never been able to understand why there was so much opposition to what he initially did. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a great question. I'm not, not sure I can get to the depths of that either. I have some, some ideas, but uh, again, they're just ideas. I, I think one of the things that was happening um, and this is a long story that I'll try to shorten, but the history of apologetics was not a very good one in, in the context of Christianity. Um, Kuiper, as you may know, uh, relegated it to what uh, Warfield called a subdivision of a subdivision, uh, put it in uh, way back in, in, in volume three of his three-volume encyclopedia. Uh, you can read about ten pages in that third volume. Again, it's not translated yet, but... Uh, if you can read the Dutch, it's there, and he's got about 10 pages on apologetics, and Warfield was astounded that um, apologetics was so far down on the list, and he, he took Kuiper to task on that. 
Now, Van Til had read Kuiper, and of course he, he knew Warfield's work because he had studied at Princeton. It was after Warfield was gone, but he'd studied from men who uh, were taught by Warfield, like Machen. And uh, so what Van Til began to do is to think through the implications of Reformed theology for the discipline of apologetics. Hmm. And there were two things going on there. I think one was there was nothing new theologically that Van Til was offering, even though much of what he was saying, because it was uh, so heavily dependent, uh, particularly on Bavink, who wasn't translated at that point, much of that was new to many uh, um, American readers. Uh Um, But it wasn't new theologically. It was the kind of thing that had been around uh, since the Reformation and and prior to that. But what was new was that Van Til began to think about that in light of how we can now converse and discuss with unbelievers just what Christianity is and how we can defend the Christian faith in the context of unbelief. That was new um, to to many that were reading Van Til. And then on top of that, Van Til was uh, so brilliant He did much of his doctoral work on um, absolute idealism following uh, Kantian and Hegelian lines, different trajectories there, but um, in absolute idealism. And so he was, much of his defense of Christianity was heavily and deeply philosophical and in an idealistic context, that is, a context of absolute idealism. And uh, there were many out there who were not as familiar with that. So Van Til would begin to use then the language of idealism in his defense of Christianity uh, in order to persuade as, as uh, vehicles of persuasion in his apologetic, and some who weren't reading him too carefully, maybe not too deeply, uh, were accusing him of being just a Christian idealist or of bowing the knee to philosophy or using language that was apostate. All sorts of charges uh, came his way. And um, I, I think, you know, I hate to put it this way, but I think Van Til was so far above his critics that they weren't really able to get at the heart of what he was trying to do. Yeah, there is always a reactionary spirit, I think, in in circles that love the Bible. If we hear something that doesn't sound exactly like what we've been told all our lives, we do tend to jump against it uh, for some reason. That's unfortunate, but it does happen. You know, Uh, it's interesting, when I was was editing Defense of the Faith, um, I was working through some of these critics who had written different pieces in a, in a periodical called the Calvin Forum in the 40s. Right. And um, I discovered that, that one of the guys there was still living, so I gave him a call and um, said, you know, just give me the context here. What was going on? Why, why the vitriol against Van Til? And, and his response was very interesting. He said, you know, a lot of us were just kind of young philosophers, and we were just trying to make our way in the world, and we just thought this would be a good, a good way to go at it. So, uh-huh. you know, I, I got the distinct impression that it wasn't, uh, taken as seriously as it should have been during the time that it was, uh, it, the critics were, were lodging those bombs against him. Interesting. So, you know, I, I think in, in one sense, um, Van Til took that very hard, and he took it very seriously, and he tried to clarify himself, and, and I think much of that was helpful to him, but um, I do think there weren't many listening to him, and I don't <laughs> think there are many listening to him today either, not as many as there should be. Yeah, I want to ask you about that when I get a chance here in a minute. Uh, out of those controversies, those kind of original controversies with his work, uh, you say that was the impetus for the book, The Defense of the Faith, uh, right. in the forward. And I, little beknownst to me, uh, I had a much smaller version of the Defense of the Faith that I had not paid attention to was the second and third editions. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had excised a bunch of the material out. Uh, and you have brought back the the original edition uh, in in a very handsomely published by PNR uh, if, uh, edition of that book. Right. Uh, and and what was your goal in in bringing back the the, the full version of that work? Well. Um when, when P&R asked me to do it, I, I, I told them I would agree to do it only if they would agree to publish the original edition. And, and oh. the reason for that was because some of that material that was excised was done so because the, the debates weren't going on anymore by the time the second and third edition rolled around. So they thought, let's just get some of this stuff out of there so we can stick to the point. Maybe it won't be as cumbersome. Yeah. And I can see the, the reasoning behind that. But um, the point I made to P&R was we need to have this whole context set out for us because it relates to everything else that Van Til says in his other syllabuses and some of his other books. And, and if we don't have everything here, I just feel like we're going to be um, uh, not giving the reader what they deserve. So um, I, I said, I realize that it's, uh, some of it is, um, is passe and, and gone now, but still, because it's the context in which he was operating, I think we need to have it out there. And, and I agreed that um, as much as I was a- able to in the footnotes and 
comments that I try to make as clear as I could what he was uh, what he was debating during those times. Absolutely. So th- they agreed to put it all in there, and it's it's the it's only the second time that edition has been published. The first one was the original in '55, and second one was the one that they published uh, recently. Good. All right. Well, my guest is Dr. K. Scott Oliphant of Westminster Seminary. The book is The Defense of the Faith by Cornelius Van Til, edited by Professor Oliphant. We'll be back with uh, segment two of this interview uh, in a few minutes.